Wake Med Health and Hospitals presents Head to Toe, our fall seminar series. Now for tonight's featured speaker. Thank you. If everybody will help me welcome Dr. Mark Wood. Good evening. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. I'd like to start by thanking the Wake Med folks for inviting me to give this talk and Really pleased to see each of you here tonight, and thank you for your time uh, tonight. Hopefully it'll be educational. I'd like for it to be very um, laid back, feel comfortable asking questions. We'll have time to do that. Uh, Dan and Jeff, you'll meet, are really excellent in the prevention side. Um, it's better when you see them and not me. Um, I'll talk a lot about the, the common injuries. It's, it's quite a daunting task to try to pick the things that most people want to hear about. Um, so we'll cover a lot of topics in your handouts. There's a uh, every slide so you can take notes and write down questions and we'll be happy to go over them uh, towards the end. So tonight, as you have heard, we'll talk about orthopedic injuries and how to prevent them. So as an overview, um, we'll go over different types of injuries, the overuse injuries, sprains and strains. We'll talk about more acute injuries, particularly of the knee. We'll talk about the meniscus, also the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament. In the shoulder, we'll discuss separations, different types of tears in the shoulder, and then some fractures around the shoulder. And then as we discuss, we'll move forward and talk about some prevention with Dan and Jeff. So for uh, definition purposes, overuse versus acute injuries. Um, overuse injuries are a series of excessive and repeated small injuries that results in injuries to the bones, muscles, or tendons involved in that action. Acute injuries obviously are more sudden or traumatic. You can have sprains, which could be partial tears or full thickness tears of a ligament. Uh, strains are typically the muscle or the tendon injury. And then fractures obviously are injuries to the bones. So we'll go over several uh, common overuse type injuries, also some strains and common sprains. In the shoulder and elbow, we'll talk about bursitis and then rotator cuff tendonitis. Around the elbow, uh, lateral epicondylitis, which is better known as tennis elbow to most uh, people. Um, in the knee, the most common overuse injury is what we call patellofemoral syndrome. It's basically pain under your kneecap. Um, and then in the foot and ankle, we'll talk about uh, ankle sprains, which are very common, as well as heel pain or plantar fasciitis. So the rotator cuff, uh, this diagram you see basically shows a shoulder. And then anywhere in your body you have things that need to slide past one another, you have a, a bursa. So think of a bursa as a, a fluid-filled sac to allow things to slide. So in this example, when you lift your arm, the bursa allows the rotator cuff to slide. Here is the shoulder, and this is the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff is a tendon that's attached to a muscle. The importance of it is it attaches to the, the ball or the humeral head um, to help hold the humeral head into the socket. So when you lift your arm, the rotator cuff is very important to allow that. In general, patients who have bursitis or tendonitis will have pain, especially with overhead activities such as painting or even fixing your hair. Most patients have difficulty sleeping, particularly laying on the affected side. Um, again, it's usually because of overuse or inflammation around that bursa. Um, usually in the spring, uh, it's popular when people go out and play tennis. First couple times out, they swing too much, overuse it, and they come in complaining of shoulder pain. The treatment for this, uh, in general, the, the standard over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications like Aleve or ibuprofen are commonly helpful. Uh, physical therapy is very helpful. Occasionally we'll take cortisone and literally inject it. So people who have an injection for bursitis, we literally inject cortisone into this bursa. And then uh, surgery is very rarely needed, but if all else fails, there are some procedures we can do to fix that. Lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. You can see in this picture, this is an elbow, and on the outside portion of the elbow, there's a, a small bump. That's the lateral epicondyle. Um, basically, there's tendons that is insert there. So lateral epicondylitis is injury to the tendon insertion at that area from repetitive microtrauma. Uh, very commonly uh, seen in excessive use, like in racket sports, racquetball, or tennis. Uh, many patients will find just simple daily activities such as holding a cup of coffee or shaking hands can cause pain in this area. Patellofemoral syndrome, again, fancy medical name for pain under your kneecap. 
You can see in this diagram here, here's a picture of a knee, um, patellofemoral syndrome. It's really just pain under the kneecap. It's, it's due to increased contact pressures of the cartilage under the kneecap. It's generally caused by overuse, or some people have improper alignment. Uh, the pain is worse typically when patients are walking up and down stairs, running up or down hills, squatting or sitting with the knees bent. So many people who sit for prolonged periods in church or at a movie, those first few steps when you, when you um, stand up, that's patellofemoral syndrome. Some people even get to a point where they literally feel or hear crunching under the knee when they bend and uh, straighten their knee. The treatment, we can kind of group the treatment all together. Uh, Dan and Jeff will also uh, touch on this, but we've all heard of RICE, which is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. The most important of these is rest. So a lot of these injuries um, will get better if you just give it time. And it's hard to do sometimes depending on your, your job or your uh, lifestyle and activities, but you just you basically need to stop doing the activities that cause pain. So if it hurts to run on hard surfaces, you might consider swimming or, or cycling. Um, physical therapy, we'll talk about um, towards the end. Again, anti-inflammatories. There's a whole lot of straps and braces uh, generally available at, um, at you know pharmacies and athletic stores. And again, the majority of these uh, overuse injuries are preventable and rarely require any surgery. Uh, ankle sprains are very common. Um, it's typically the outside or the lateral side of the ankle. So. You can see this arrow is pointing to the ligaments on the outside of the ankle. Most patients, um, they'll describe rolling the ankle, literally where they turn the, the ankle. Um, if you can walk on the ankle, it's probably just a sprain. If you can't walk on an ankle, you're probably in x-rays because those who can't weight bear may have a fracture. The treatment, rice, again, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, we stress the importance of physical therapy with ankle sprains. It seems like a a uh, very common injury, very benign injury. Uh, many patients will continue to, to, to sprain their ankle if they don't do some of the special therapy. So pretty much every patient I see with an ankle sprain, I, I send them to the physical therapist because it's been proven to decrease the chance of recurrence of sprains in the future. Plantar fasciitis, a very common uh, problem. Basically, it's pain at the heel. So as this picture shows, the bottom of your foot, you have a very thick band of tissue um, it's called fascia. So the plantar means the bottom of the foot. Fasciitis is inflammation of this fascia or this thick tissue which inserts on your heel bone. Uh, most patients find the first few steps in the morning are the, are the worst and gradually it may get better during the day. Uh, the, the treatment, number one, is stretching. Um, heel cups you can get over the counter. The Dr. Scholl stuff is just fine. Anti-inflammatories help when you uh, move up the um, options, these night splints, um, I, you see them on airplane magazines, they basically hold the foot in an optimal position during the night so those first few, few steps aren't so bad. Uh, physical therapy may help and on a very rare occasion injections might be needed and then surgeries almost never needed. So move on to acute injuries. Um, I put this slide in here just so that people who are dozing off after their sandwich can wake back up but this is a the national or the uh, national championship for college football, and you'll see this is an acute injury. So there's a and nobody got the hold right here. Everybody paid attention to the uh, the knee injury, but that would be um, more of an acute or a sudden traumatic injury. So if we look at the acute knee injuries, we'll go over some of the anatomy. Um, tonight we'll focus on the meniscus. Think of the meniscus as a shock absorber. There's one on the inside and the outside part of the knee. Another common injury is the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament. The ACL is a ligament on the middle of the knee. It basically is very important for stability of the knee. So meniscal tears first. Think of the meniscus as a shock absorber. It's a, it's a special type of cartilage, but it's there to um, provide a shock absorber for the, the remaining part of the cartilage. Um, it typically occurs by twisting or a hyperflexion or where you bend the knee too far type injury. Uh, most patients will find that they have pain along their joint line. Occasionally, they might have popping or catching. Occasionally, the meniscus tears and literally flips up into the front of the knee, and it literally locks the knee up where you can't bend your knee anymore. I do have a picture later. I'll show you of that. Um, in general, x-rays are completely normal because it's a soft tissue. We need an MRI to usually diagnose it. So the, think of the meniscus as a kind of a, a C-shaped uh, ring inside the knee. 
So this is a diagram of that. When we get an MRI, basically all an MRI is is taking pictures and we look at different parts of the anatomy in cross-section. So we'll take a picture here and a picture here. So when you see the MRI, this is the knee. Here's a cross-section of the knee. This triangular structure is a meniscus. and This arrow points to a white stripe. That would be what an MRI meniscus tear would appear to look like. So we do a lot of arthroscopy. Arthroscopy is basically inserting a small camera into the knee um, to uh, basically visualize any injuries and fix them. So here's a picture of an arth arthroscopic picture where you see the, the femur, the top bone, the tibia on the bottom, and here's that C-shaped shock absorber. So that would be a normal appearing meniscus. On the other side of this patient's knee, again, the top and bottom are the bones and the cartilage, and this is an example of what a meniscus tear might look like. So to treat meniscal tears, usually we just remove the torn portion. We'd like to repair all menisci, but only about uh, probably 5% are repairable. That has to do with the way um, the anatomy is and the blood supply. Uh, and so as much as we'd like to fix them, usually when you have a, an arthroscopy for a meniscus tear, the surgeon just removes a small torn portion. So how do we do that? Um, here's a diagram of a, of a knee. This is a torn meniscus that you see here. There's a lot of different patterns. Basically to treat these, we put a camera through a small incision into the knee. Here is the torn piece of cartilage. So we really get a picture that looks something like this. So if we blow that up, this is what the TV image would look like in the operating room. And we have special instruments that we can put through small incisions and remove the torn portion. This is actually a patient who had a meniscus tear and an ACL injury. So again, we're looking into the knee with a camera. Here's the meniscus in the background. The tear you can kind of make out here. This is a probe, or it's about a, it's a, a tool we use to kind of serves as our extension of our finger so we can poke and prod and pull and examine on the inside. You can see if we take this probe and pull on it, it clearly shows a torn meniscus, which is a shock absorber. This is an example of one that we were able to repair. We're just special devices now. We're through the same small incisions. We can put a suture in and, and repair the meniscus so it'll heal. So moving on to the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament. Basically, just less the meniscus, you can't see the ACL on an x-ray. So here's an example of a torn ACL. In general, the ACL doesn't tear right in the middle. It, it usually tears off the femur or the top bone, which I'll show you more clearly in a minute. We need an MRI to diagnose an ACL tear. So this is a, a diagram of the femur and the tibia. Here's the kneecap in front. And you should see a black stripe running across here, which would be the ACL. So this is an example of what a torn ACL on an MRI might look like. Most ACL injuries are not from a direct blow. Only about 30% of them come from some contact or collision. Most of them are just from jumping and landing in a funny position. So 70% of all the ACL tears are just from simply uh, landing awkwardly. It's really interesting. For uh, There's a lot of reasons for it, but uh, females are much more likely than males to have an ACL injury, up to eight times more likely, especially in some sports. Um, really, any patient who has a uh, lands awkwardly, especially if they feel a pop and have a swollen knee, there's a 75% chance they've torn their ACL. So we stress that uh, to patients if... You know, you have instability or you have pain or swelling, you probably need to be evaluated because most patients with an ACL tear won't do well. So as far as the treatment, in general, age doesn't matter. Activity matters. So, um, you know, when I was in training, we would, 35 or 40 years old was kind of the, the upper limits. We fix ACLs on 65-year-olds and 70-year-olds now, depending on their activity level. The reason we fix them is because it allows you to return to your active lifestyle, particularly work or sports. And the other reason we fix them is because we know if you don't have an ACL or you have a torn ACL, you end up having more problems. So over, over the years, if you don't have an ACL, 70% of those patients will go on to lose cartilage. This is an example of an arthroscopic picture with a bone showing through. We have a hard time fixing these problems with cartilage. Again, we talked about the locked knee earlier. So this is an example of the meniscus. It's been torn and is now flipped into the joint. So this patient is unable to flex or extend their knee anymore because of the meniscus tear. Nearly all patients who have an ACL deficient knee will end up tearing their meniscus. So active people in general who have an ACL tear, we recommend fixing that 
to allow them to return to sports or work or lifestyle, but also to prevent these problems. So, more arthroscopic pictures. This is an example of what a normal ACL would look like in the knee. In the middle picture is a picture of a torn ACL, and you can see it's no longer connected to the top. This is an example of a reconstructed ACL. The problem with the ACL is it has no blood supply, and so you can't really repair it. You have to reconstruct it. To do that, we take some sort of graft. There's two types of graft. This particular example here is the, the hamstring tendon from the patient that we take. We then uh, fix it and prepare it to pass through to make a new ACL. So we have a choice. We have the patient's tissue, and then we have cadaver tissue. There's pros and cons to each. The good news is ACL surgery works predictably well. Most patients are going to return to their previous level of function, but it does require a commitment to rehab for six to nine months. Another patient who had a pop and instability. Again, you can see we put a camera in the knee. We're assessing the ACL. These are kind of the pictures we get. So this is an intraoperative video. The back ligament called the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament, some of you may have heard of that. That's generally spared, but here's the picture of this patient's ACL, and so we're looking at the PCL there with this probe, and then you can see here that ACL is torn off where it belongs back here. So to fix that, we can't repair it. We have to reconstruct it. So in this particular patient, the next picture shows the ACL stump has been removed. We then take grafts and pass it through the appropriate um, tunnels so here's the intraoperative picture before and after with the new ACL. And then here's kind of a diagram to show you how this works. This portion that you see here is the same portion you see here. So this is what's going to become the new ACL. And then through a variety of methods, we fix the, 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 the two ends on each side. It takes six to nine months to heal and rehabilitate. So moving on to shoulder injuries, we'll go over some of the uh, common shoulder anatomy. The clavicle, also known as the collarbone, we'll talk about. The AC joint stands for acromioclavicular. So AC joint is this very small joint right here. When you hear of a separation or a uh, separated shoulder, this is the small joint that's being referred to. And the larger joint, the one we think of more commonly, the ball and socket, is called the glenohumeral joint. So we'll talk about injuries to each of these. This is kind of a the 200 level course, but the reason I put this slide in is because the you think of the, the shoulder, you have lots of range of motion. The sacrifice for motion is more instability. And so if you think of the shoulder, it's more like a grapefruit sitting on a, on a saucer. And there's not much stability. It, it requires the soft tissues around the shoulder to hold the ball into the socket. So with this diagram, things to point out, we'll talk about these ligaments here are what hold the AC joint down. So when we show the separations, these ligaments are what's important. Many people don't realize it, but your biceps tendon, meaning the biceps muscle, actually has one of the tendons that goes inside the shoulder and inserts on a ring of cartilage called the labrum. So you may hear of labral tears. Think of the, one of my patients said the labrum is like the O-ring of the shoulder. And if you look, it basically is a circular ring of cartilage around the socket. So this picture is looking at the socket and the ball, or the humeral head, has been removed. There's lots of ligaments. The details of that don't matter, except for these ligaments normally are what keeps the, the, the shoulder stable. They also attach to this thing called the labrum. And so many times when the labrum is torn, patients have instability because now the ligaments no longer attach to the socket. So there's nothing that keeps this, the ball within the socket. Separations. Basically, if you see a, usually it's a quarterback who gets tackled and they run off the field with their arm dangling to the side, that's usually a separation. And a, a separation is basically a, an injury to that small joint called the acromioclavicular joint. It's uh, very painful. A lot of patients will actually notice a deformity or a bump. Uh, we typically need x rays to help with this diagnosis. So this is a picture of a, one of my patients who we get a, a, a large x-ray so that we can compare the two sides. So on the, this patient, this side you can see clearly that joint is disrupted compared to the other side. The reason that happens is because when you fall, you tear these ligaments. And if you compare the distance between these two sides, it's clear that there's a difference. 
So the way this happens is these ligaments, which normally hold things down, are torn when there's a direct force, usually a fall, onto the shoulder. So the normal ligaments, which hold everything in the appropriate position, are torn, leading to the x-ray like we saw earlier. In general, if it's minimally displaced, we can do fine with a sling. If it's uh, more displaced, we typically need to fix it. We've looked at all the different types of injuries, and, and in general, the ones that are more displaced do not do well unless we fix them. Um, there's over 80 procedures described for this uh, procedures described for this injury. Usually in orthopedics, if we have 80 procedures, it means that none of them are very good. Um, so up until recently, over the last literally three to four years, there's been some newer arthroscopic techniques, which we do now, which provide a much more favorable surgical result. So I'll show you how we do this. This is actually a patient of mine who was curling in Raleigh. So we do the Olympic sport where they push the little rocks or the stones. Um, he was at a work event, but he literally got injured curling where he slipped on the ice. So here's his x-ray. Again, you can see this disruption compared to the other side. The way we do this now is that we actually put a camera in where we can look underneath this bone. So this circle here is what we would see on the, on the screen. And so this, this area here is actually the bone that you see over here. So to do these, we have cameras and um, arth arthroscopes, then we have x-ray machines, so we have TV screens and x-ray machines, and everything we do are through tiny incisions, and we're using those as a guide to know where we're putting our implants. So this is an x-ray picture of how we do it. This is actually, if you look at this, maybe, yeah. this is actually the, the camera. And we're looking up and under this bone. And you can see here what we do is we drill a tunnel back where those ligaments belong. We pass these special devices through. And then we can tie things back down and allow them to heal in the appropriate position. So this would be the example of this patient after we fixed them and we expect good results. And instead of the old days where we those 80 procedures we described, the, the biggest challenge was how to hold the, hold the uh, anatomy back where it belongs. We used to make incisions that really came all the way down the shoulder. Very painful. You stay in the hospital for a couple of days. We now do these procedures in usually under an hour, and patients go home the same day. And this was the incision this patient received. Uh, three to four months before you do anything fun. It takes a while. So the labrum, again, you may hear the word slap. It's just orthopedic surgeons get publications when they come up with fancy names. So a doctor in California came up with slap tears. Think of the slap, basically the L means labrum. And if you look at this diagram, again, the labrum is that ring of cartilage around the socket. So you see that here. We, we, we come up with uh, slap means superior labral anterior posterior. Again, fancy... Uh, medical jargon, so patients don't really know what we're talking about when we talk in front of them, but in general, superior means top, anterior to posterior means front to back. So these particular tears are of the labrum on the top part of the socket, and they tear from front to back. Usually it's from a fall or a traction injury. Sometimes overhead athletes will have this injury, and we usually need an MRI with dye in the shoulder. 50% uh, of the normal MRIs won't show this tear, so I see quite a few patients who had a normal MRI, usually by their primary care physician, but continue to have shoulder troubles. And when I see them, the first thing I think of, it's probably a labral tear, because you just the MRIs sometimes are negative um, when they really do have an injury. This is an example of an MRI. Again, the ball and socket. And if you look at the labrum, here we have the dye. This white is the dye that we put inside the shoulder, and you can see the white line tracking underneath the labrum. That's an example of a labral tear or on the top, we call it a slap tear. So how do we fix them? Basically, again, looking through the camera, arthroscopic techniques. Here is the socket, or the glenoid. Here is the labrum, which is a ring of cartilage. Here is the biceps tendon. Again, that diagram I showed you earlier, the actual biceps inserts onto the labrum. And then again, we're using probes inside the shoulder to... Uh, pull and uh, prod and fill inside the shoulder. So this by itself looks like a pretty normal shoulder, but if we take our probe, you can see when we lift up on this labrum, clearly this labrum is no longer connected to the socket where it belongs. Patients will not do well with this injury until we fix it. And so the way we fix it is we put special anchors in the bone and tie it back down. So here's an example of 
how we do that. So these are some arthroscopic videos. These are, this is a special shaver. It's really only four millimeters in diameter. It looks huge on these uh, blown up pictures, but what we're doing here is preparing the area, literally inducing bleeding so that we have a healing response. We then put an anchor in the bone. These are the sutures we want to wrap around and tie with. I'll show you how we do that in a, in a few slides later. And then we have special devices to, to shuttle and pass sutures. And all this work is done outside the body and we pass them through things like these cannulas here to do all the work. And so in this particular video, we're taking this special device and we pass sutures in the area where we, where we want our permanent suture to stay. What we'll do then is we'll take both of those sutures, we'll pull them out of that cannula. Again, these are the small incisions around the shoulder that allow us to access and get our instruments in. So we pull them out and we literally use this suture to pass the one that we want to stay. So we'll pull on the other limb and you'll see what happens is we'll take the suture that we want to pass and as you pull, it passes it back around the labrum. So what you end up with is kind of this configuration. We have special ways to tie knots. I'll show you a video of that in a little bit. So you end up with one fixation point here and usually two fixation points, sometimes three, to tie that labrum back down to stabilize the biceps anchor. Shoulder dislocations, uh, again, very common, um, usually from a fall. Um, just think of it as the ball pops out of the socket and stays there. Most patients are in severe pain and almost all patients need to go to the emergency room, have some sedation, and then they reduce it, meaning they take the ball and put it back where it belongs. Problem with dislocations are that you tear the structure. So the labral tears we talked about, we'll talk about rotator cuff tears as well. And generally you have to get x-rays to be sure the ball is back reduced inside the socket. You also want to make sure there's no fractures. Uh, most patients will end up needing an MRI simply to look at these soft tissue structures, the labrum and then the rotator cuff. Here's an x-ray. Basically, this is a normal x-ray of the, the ball reduced, meaning right in the, the middle of the socket. And this would be an example of a dislocated shoulder. Where here's the socket. You'd expect the ball to be here, but you can see it's way down here. So that's why you go to the emergency room. Again, the MRIs are important because they show us other injuries you otherwise wouldn't know about. So in this particular MRI, here is the rotator cuff attaching onto the ball. Here is the socket. And you can see this triangular structure here is actually the labrum. This labrum belongs attached to the socket. And you can see there's clearly a separation. The other thing that happens when you dislocate, see this little indention here. Literally when the ball goes out the front, this would be the front, you get an impaction fracture where the corner of the socket digs into the back of the ball. So an x-ray finding, which is more significant, sometimes you actually see where the socket created a fracture into the ball. So imaging, x-rays and MRIs, the reason we get them is because we want to know if any of these injuries are there because it matters in terms of telling a patient what they could expect in the future. So again, another busy slide, but the reason it's important is to understand why we have trouble with dislocations. The ligaments around the shoulder keep you from dislocating. When you dislocate the first time, a lot of times you tear the labrum off the socket. So Dr. Bankart, many years ago, described what we call the Bankart lesion. So if you hear the word Bankart lesion, what that describes is the labrum, which is here, is knocked off, meaning no longer attached to the socket. Well, if the ligaments are attached to the labrum, and that's what keeps your shoulder stable, and the labrum is not attached to the socket, you can imagine that there's nothing to keep you from continuing to dislocate in the future. So when you have this lesion, many times you continue to re-dislocate, or even in the younger patients nowadays, we'll go ahead and fix these right off the bat if they're at high risk for uh, high, you know, wrestling or other sports like that. So since the beginning of time, you just pull on the shoulder and put it back in the joint. Um, we like to do this sooner than later. Many of the nerves are on stretch, and you can get injuries to that if you don't um, get it put back into the socket. Um, in general, it's a short-term immobilization and maybe some rehabilitation. Um, there are arthroscopic fixation for this. Again, probably 10 or 15 years ago, we didn't have these techniques, so we never offered earlier procedures because we didn't have a great way to fix patients. We had big incisions and hard recoveries and multiple days in the hospital, 
So you waited till a patient was really debilitated with multiple dislocations. Nowadays, through three tiny incisions, 45 minutes of surgery, you go home the same day, we can fix these patients. So here's an example. This is an operative picture of this patient laying on their side. And the reason I show you this is because instead of the normal view you're used to, we have the patient laying on their side. So we have a special device here that literally pulls the arm out and up to get the ball and socket away from each other so we can do the procedure. We make an incision in the back and put the camera in the back of the patient. We then do all the work on the TV screen. So here's an example of what it would look like. Again, this, is the, this part's on the side since the patient's laying on their side, the glenoid or socket. Here's the ball. Here's the biceps we learned about that attaches to the labrum up top. So this labrum up top is normal. So this patient does not have a slap tear. But if you look down at the bottom, he does have a bank art tear, which is just the name for an injury to the labrum when you dislocate out the bottom. So how do we fix these? Very similar to the video you saw earlier. You can see the labrum, which is the ring of cartilage. Here's the ball up top, socket below. Here's those ligaments I talked about. You can see they're clearly attached to the labrum, which are no longer attached to the socket. So we have these probes that we can um, uh, fill around and uh, use as an extension to our fingers. Two small incisions from the front where we put the, the cannulas in. Again, you see like we did earlier, we actually literally preparing a bed for healing. In general, you need bleeding to heal. That's where the cells come in to allow things to heal. And so here's the prepared area um, in preparation for repair. You didn't see this video earlier. Basically, this is only a three millimeter drill bit. Again, tiny drill bit. But we drill a, drill a, a hole into the socket. We then pass a special anchor, which is absorbable. And to this anchor, there's attached sutures. So then we pull the drill guide out, and now we have anchor in the bone and sutures, and our goal is to pass those sutures around that labrum and then tie it back to the socket. So a lot of this is suture management, and sometimes you get quite a spider web of sutures. Another special device like you saw earlier where we literally pass a suture through the, the spot where we want the permanent, the permanent sutures to stay. So you'll see here in a second, we pass the device, we then shuttle a suture through and then pull both of those sutures out the cannula in the front. Just like before, we tie it on, pull on the other end of the suture, and we can pass sutures really anywhere we need to by these devices. So then after you pull it all the way through, you'll see now we have the suture where we need it. And this is a good example of once we pull the labrum back to the bone, you'll see the ligament off in the distance get tight. So you can see ligament now is tight just by advancing this labrum back to where it belongs. Right there. So then we have special ways to tie knots inside the shoulder. This is just an example of the types of knots we tie. You'll see in a second this special knot pusher, we call it, which is basically a way to tie knots inside the, the shoulder. And then we do this a series of times, and then we can repair really anything we need to through those small incisions. On the home stretch now, so hang in there. Rotator cuffs. Again, many people have heard of rotator cuff tears. The rotator cuff is a tendon which inserts to the ball. Okay? The rotator cuff, if you think about what it does, it just it holds the ball into the socket. So the big muscles which allow you to raise your arm don't work very well unless the ball is held into the socket. This picture here shows an example of a rotator cuff that's torn. So in general, um, these tears can happen with or without a significant injury. Some people over time continue to have worsening problems. They develop pain and weakness. They can have a rotator cuff and never knew it tore. Um, generally, they present with shoulder and upper arm pain, occasionally weakness, again, difficulty sleeping on the effective side. And in general, active people with a cuff tear, we, we recommend surgery now. And that shifted from five or 10 years ago because we have such good techniques with outpatient surgery where we can know we can fix the rotator cuff and change the patient's long-term outcome by fixing the rotator cuff when we're able. In the old days, we didn't have great techniques. We had big operations, big surgery, big incisions, hospital stays, severely painful procedures, and we just put it off as long as we could. Many times by the time you got to it, it was already torn and retracted and scarred in, and they were unable to be fixed. So we're much more aggressive now to fix it while we can before it retracts and scars in. So this is an example. This is, again, an arthroscopic picture. 
This is the ball. The socket's over here in the distance. This is the rotator cuff, and it belongs way over here. This is a very large tear. Um, once upon a time, this may have been an irreparable rotator cuff, but now we can do things with the camera to get to places we used to not be able to get to. Off in the distance over here, you see one of the cannulas way over. This is in the front of the shoulder. We're looking from the back of the shoulder. So again, the way we fix this is we put anchors that go into the bone that have sutures attached. We then pass the sutures through the soft tissues and then tie it back where we want to repair it. So here's an anchor. This happens to be a metal anchor made out of titanium. There's sutures attached to this anchor you don't see, but once we put it in the bone and remove the screwdriver, you see the anchors that are now underneath the bone have sutures attached. We then take these sutures, we pass them through the rotator cuff. So this picture here shows off in the front. These sutures you see here are now going through the rotator cuff and going out the front through this back anchor in the back. These sutures, there's one here and one here. And so when we pull these sutures, we actually advance the rotator cuff back down to the anchor, and then we tie knots. So this is a newer technique we use, which is much stronger than the older techniques. Again, all done through the camera, where we tie a knot in the front, tie a knot in the back, and then we kind of cross-hatch the knots so we get a large area of repair across this entire area of bone. So obviously, you can see how biomechanically this is a much stronger repair, which decreases the chance of tearing again. We then, after we repair it, we test it, so this is just looking at the rotator cuff repair, and all we're doing in the operating room is making sure it's nice and stable when we move the arm around. But we went from a rotator cuff torn and retracted, so now this entire rotator cuff has been advanced back down and repaired. Finally, we'll just talk about clavicle fractures because they're so common. The majority, almost all uh, clavicle or collarbone fractures can be treated with a sling. Most of them do well. The ones now that we fix are ones where they're overlap. So if there's a shortening of the bone, basically there's a shortening of your shoulder closer to the, the axis, and that can lead to problems with function. So here's a patient who had a fall. This is the collarbone. This tip here belongs way over here. And so we measure how much it's shortened. Anything over about 15 or 20 millimeters we think doesn't do very well, or we know doesn't do very well um, when it's left in that position. It may heal, but you're going to heal in a very abnormal position, which will affect your function later. And so these are the ones we fix. Again, in the old days, meaning five or ten years ago, um, we made big incisions and big screws. This patient actually we, we fixed through a literally a four millimeter incision where we just can put it back where it belongs and have, now have special devices we can run down the middle inside the bone to allow the, the fracture to heal in the normal position and instead of big incisions and stays in the hospital, these are all things that we can do, and the patient goes home the same day through very, very small incisions. And kind of like the separations, another, um, what used to be a very challenging fracture was when you have a clavicle fracture towards the joint. And if you look at this, it's kind of like the separations we saw. So these newer devices we use now to treat the separations are the same ones we can use through arthroscopic incisions to put these things back down where they belong and predictably they heal. So We've come a long way in terms of things we have available now compared to the way we used to do, do things. So lots of material. Um, again, the handouts have everything in it, but if there's just a, a, a few summary points or pearls that you can take home. I think these are um, kind of the key features of tonight's presentation. So the overuse injuries, strains and sprains, they typically heal, but you've you got to give them time to heal. So uh, the, the hardest patients to get to take time off are those who are on a exercise program or uh, involved with tennis or something where they uh, just, just, just can't find time to uh, allow things to heal. The knee injuries we talked about, the anterior cruciate ligament and the meniscus, both of which are commonly torn due to their limited blood supply, due to their anatomy, they typically will not heal on their own. So that, those are the reasons we do arthroscopy. We put the camera in the knee, we typically can fix them and expect a great result from that. And the shoulder injuries, and dislocations are common, rotator cuff injuries are common, labral injuries are common. The problem with each of these structures, they, again, they typically will not heal on their own. And so the good news is that we do have procedures, all arthroscopic, uh, minimal incisions. You go home the same day where we can expect a good favorable result and return to your previous level of function. Finally, many of our injuries that we have are preventable, but it does require attention and commitment to the proven techniques. 
Uh, Dan and Jeff will talk more about that shortly. There's some resources I listed on your uh, page. These are from our academy and through our Wake Orthopedics website where we have a lot of information. Um, you can point and click and read and scroll and there's just a lot of pictures. Many of the pictures you saw tonight are from these, from these web pages. Preventing sports injuries is, a, is kind of a, a newer, kind of hot topic. Again, this is a website sponsored by multiple of our academies, basically to help prevent sports injuries. I'd like to thank each of you for your time and be happy to answer any questions.